Okay, let's talk about Webern's uh, Opus 27 Piano Variations. The first thing I'd like you to do is click on the link below this video in the comments section or whatever it is, description section. And this is, I know there's been a lot of Glenn Gould, but I think he was the best interpreter of the music of the, well, at least the 12 tone serial music of the Second Viennese School. So please click on his beautifully filmed video of the Webern piano variations, all three movements. It's about a six and a half minute video. So please pause this and watch this, that, and then we'll talk about it. Okay, I'm assuming you were able to watch and listen to Glenn Gould play the piano variations. And I want to say a few preliminary words about this piece, and then we'll dive into it. Um, the worksheet, worksheet 2.4, covers everything pretty much that you need to know about this piece. And um, you know, we're talking about 12-tone serialism. We talk about Weber more than the other composers of 12-tone serialism because he's had the most influence, the most impact. He's the one that took the 12-tone method and actually used it to sort of really rebuild musical texture form, texture and form mainly, really kind of redo what music is. And I've talked about this before, the, the main innovation I would say of, of Webern is pointillism, creating a musical texture that's not monophony, polyphony, uh, homophony, or heterophony, it's really pointillism. It's uh, music made out of um, small either points or one to three note units really is what it's made of. Now it's different from pointillism in the context of painting Seurat, the painter that we're familiar with, um, created of course images that we're now familiar because everything we look at that's not in real life is pixelated, but creating uh, images with dots of various colors. That's not what this kind of pointillism is. I'm not sure I can define what it is it, other than saying it's music that is formed out of small chunks that are more or less disconnected from each other, not completely. And that doesn't mean we can't find melody or harmony or counterpoint in this music, but I think um, that's not the main feature. Okay, and one thing you will notice may have noticed about the, um, the uh, listening to the piano variations, of course, lots of fun to watch Glenn Gould perform in his very low chair and just the ardor and the passion that he brings to it and the, the love that he brings to this music. And um, you'll also notice, especially the second movement, which is the one we will talk about less than a minute long, it's the most analyzed single page of music in the world, I would say. But you may have noticed that there was a lot of hand crossing in that movement. And here, I've got the, t the score here. If you look at this, and this has been marked up, this was marked up by my teacher, John Ron, but if you look from beginning to end, you'll notice that the right and the left hands are equal in terms of what part of the keyboard they occupy. They're completely equal. You could switch the right and left hands around and it would make no difference. And so, um, and the topic of this, this subunit is symmetry. And symmetry is very important. It's sort of the main theme of, of, of certainly not just Music 296, but even Music 295 is this movement from asymmetry, the asymmetry of the diatonic collection and of uh, pre-equal tempered tuning systems. And the story of these two, you know, second year theory classes, at least part of it, is this motion from asymmetry, uh, what we might call well-formedness, um, to symmetry. And there are at least two different kinds of symmetries we're talking about. Now, of course, uh, we talked about in uh, Music 295 how, uh, and 296, how symmetrical configurations of the octave were an inevitable result of the adoption of equal temperament during the 19th century. So naturally, the diminished seventh chord and the augmented triad, and then later the whole tone scale, and then later the octatonic scale, which are more or less, well, some of them are completely symmetrical divisions of the octave, um, kind of take over for the asymmetrical formations of major and minor triads and major and minor scales. And again, those 
uh, equal divisions, those symmetrical divisions, make less sense when we're having a tuning system that's not equal tempered. Equal tempered, uh, adoption of equal temperament makes them sort of inevitable. Now, in these, the piece we'll talk about today and the Opus 27 piano variations and then the Opus 21 symphony by Webern uh, are real studies in symmetries, at least two different kinds of symmetries. One of them, probably the most important, inversional symmetry. So this means, uh, you know, chords and formations that uh, are symmetrical uh, around a, a fixed pitch axis is one way we could look at it. And um, in this piece, we will notice this right at the beginning. And um, I will say from the start, this whole piece is constructed, this whole second movement of the piano variations is constructed as what we would call an inversional um, uh, canon, an inversion canon, sorry. And what does that mean? Well, a canon, as you know, uh, we can talk about canons a lot, but canon uh, we usually think of as being a piece in which more than one voice or instrument plays the same music but starts at different times and then the, the music harmonizes correctly. One kind of canon, of course, is the round, and you're familiar with rounds such as Row, Row, Row Your Boat and Frere Jaca. Um, those are a type of canon um, called a round, um, but canon, the word canon, comes from uh, a word for rule or law. And so one way to look at it is that um, composers in the oh, Renaissance, uh, Baroque, and later, um, but a lot in the Renaissance and Baroque, would write pieces where they would give a single melodic line, and then they would give a rule for how to perform that with more than one voice or instrument. And that instruction would be the rule or the canon, okay? The simplest one being, okay, one person starts and then the next person starts a bar later, let's say, and then that, that, that's how those rounds work. Well, there are many more possibilities. For instance, okay, one person starts, the next person plays a bar later, but plays the melody upside down, or the next person plays the melody backwards from end to beginning. We know that as being the retrograde. Um, or the second person, and in, in canons, these are called the leader or the follower. The follower comes in playing the values at double the length or half the length. Anyway, those are all canons or rules for interpreting a, uh, a piece of this kind. And in fact, some of them were, they would call them puzzle or enigma canons where either the composer would not indicate how to interpret this canon or he or she would give a kind of riddle, kind of like, you know, the villains who gave Batman riddles, you know, a riddle for how to interpret this um, canon. Anyway, but this one's all written out. It's not a canon in, in that sense. But we'll notice that if we think of the left hand as being the leader and the right hand as being the follower, uh, let's put this over here, we start with, um, we notice that these are uh, the duration, the temporal duration, uh, I mean the duration interval between the leader and the follower, the, if you want to use Latin dux and comes, is only an eighth note. So that's pretty nutty. You know, we don't usually see canons where the leader and the follower are so close together like that. Uh, the only example I can think of is like the music of Steve Reich, the great minimalist, who uh, used a, a kind of a canon technique called phasing, where um, the interval, the time interval between the leader and follower would be very close or imperceptible and gradually get wider. We'll study that uh, in the next unit. But anyway, okay, separated by an eighth note. And let's look at what happens. The... Um, the left hand starts here. I'm going to move. Okay, let's pick up where we left off. I realized I didn't have a piano where I was. Now, um, okay, so let's let's look at this. So we start off left hand. Isn't that funny playing this B flat way up here, and then the right hand playing this G sharp down there. Okay, so and then this goes down. 
to this A minor ninth. This one goes from G sharp to, to A, same A there. So down a minor ninth, up a minor ninth. Then this one goes up or down a minor sixth. This one goes up a minor sixth. And this one goes down a major ninth and up a minor third. And then this one goes up a major ninth and down a minor third. What you can see is these intervals, the left hand is being copied exactly in the right hand except upside down. Not just in terms of pitch class, which we've seen a lot in, you know, inverting a 12 tone roll, but in terms of pitch. So the exact intervals up and down are being um, repeated in the follower, in the right hand, going in the opposite direction. So that's an inversion canon. This goes throughout the entire piece, including these chords. So um, now, then we want to say, okay, that's cool. Is there an axis of symmetry that defines this relationship, this, uh, you know, inversional connection? Yes, there is. We could figure this out any number of ways, but we could figure out what the distance between any of these pairs of pitches is. So, for instance, we've got this G sharp down here, and then this B flat. Uh, that's what? Two octaves plus two semitones. Um, 12, 24, 20, 26 semitones. So it's going to be 13 semitones down from here and up from here. We hope that's going to work. Let's take our G sharp and go up 13 semitones. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13. And then this one, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13. That happens to be A, this A. And in fact, the fact that these two notes are the same also tells us that this is the axis of symmetry. We could test it here. Here's a C sharp four, and then an F five. Uh, those are uh, what? Twelve plus um, four. Sixteen semitones divide. Sixteen semitones divided by two is eight. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. There's our A. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Okay, so. This is the axis of symmetry right here, that A, you know, we know it as A440, the tuning A. Uh, so that's cool. So if we look throughout this piece, and um, these two, the right and the left hand, always pitches in pairs, always, always. And each of those, the members of those pairs, are equidistant from this A, you know, so... So that's, that's what's going to happen there. We'll come back to that. Um, so, to, to review, it's an inversion canon, rhythmically the same, uh, intervals the same except in opposite directions. And that means that sometimes the hands, a lot of the time the hands cross. Uh, they basically have the same amount of pitches on either side of that A. Okay, let's look at a few other things. Here's our, here's our row, and we might ask, is this a derived row? Let's zoom in a little bit. And the answer is no, it's not a derived row. Um, here we've got 0, 1, 4, that's cool. And then we've got a 0, 1, 3. Already it's not derived from trichords. Here's a 0, 1, 2, here's a 0, 0, 1, 5. I mean, it's all different trichords. Um, it may be hexachordally derived, but as I pointed out before, I don't recognize that as a relationship. Um, okay, now let's, uh, let's look at a few other ideas here. Now, here I gave you this and asked you to, let's go back to this view. I asked you to come up with the uh, rest of the 12 count. Well, rather than write this in, I'll show you this 12 count, which is kind of fun. Um, 
I'll show you why. I don't know. Maybe you don't think this kind of thing's fun, but let's have a look. Um, now, this was this is a 12 count that one of my teachers did, John Ron, and he has a slightly different terminology. Instead of P, he uses T, meaning transposition, and instead of I, he uses T N I. Oh, you can't see that. T T N I. That's the same as I. Same thing. And T is P. And, um, well, we'll leave it at that because we only have P's and I's in this. And then he numbers, his order numbers are from 0 to 11 instead of from 1 to 12. We've been doing from 1 to 12. But I just want to show you this because I want to show you that uh, some theorists do their 12 counts from 0 to 11 instead of from 1 to 12. It doesn't matter as far as I'm concerned. I find it slightly easier to go from 1 to 12, but not everybody agrees with me. Okay, so then let's have a look at what happens here. We have, um, starting from that last note of this A section, we have um, share a note with this row form and share a note with this row form. And then we have I0 up here and you'll notice where it goes you know 0 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 8 9 10 11 and then um, that is also used as the first note of the next um, row form up in the right hand we have P10 or what he calls it T10 it starts here from the last note of this A section. One, two, three. Anyway, it goes straight across in the right hand. This is um, convenient. And then we, um, starting here, we share a note from the right hand from the end of this row form and the beginning of the next row form. That happens. And we have the P7 or the T7 and then the T3I or the I3. And then you'll notice after the second order number they cross, and then this is this is the P7 now, and this is actually the I3 up here, and continues to the end. Of course, there's a repeat, so it starts over again. Conveniently, you'll notice that that's the same thing, so it works pretty well. Okay, now we want to talk about. Okay, first of all, we know that. This is an inversion canon, and that every that the piece is built out of pairs of notes between the right and left hand, and that each of those pairs of notes is equidistant from this A, okay? Thus creating an inversion canon. Okay, well, how does he pull this off? There are two things he uses to make this work. You know, if he didn't have to use the 12-tone system, you could just do it. You wouldn't even have to think about it, especially since we're in the emancipation of the dissonance. In previous eras, the trick about writing a canon was to make it work with the laws or rules of harmony and, and uh, resolution of dissonance, etc. There's none of that in atonal music. Uh, however, the trick is making this work with the 12-tone method, although the 12-tone method actually helps it happen. But anyway, how do we do that? Well, there are two things. One of them is that Webern um, uses a, uh, and I gotta find it here. Here's someone. Here it is. He uses a um, pitch gamut. I don't know, you may or may not have heard this term gamut. Um, the word gamut was used in medieval music to indicate allowable, the allowable pitch range. Um, and it's used in other fields as well. But basically, uh, Webern loved limitations. He, he loved, he was the opposite of Schoenberg. Schoenberg was a maximalist, Webern was a minimalist, and Webern liked to start out by limiting his choices. And this is what he did. He took this, um, these are all the allowable pitches, not just pitch classes, for this movement. 
and you can see there's a total of, now I can't remember, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. So 21, 21 pitch gamut. Um, then there's some other interesting things. There's another uh, embedded pitch gamut within this one, consisting of uh, these seven pitches. And um, the, the pitch classes that appear only once in the gamut are also symmetrical around A4. And then E-flat appears four times, of course, E-flat being a tritone in both directions. We would expect it to happen. The remaining pitch classes appear two or three times. So by having this limited number of pitches to draw from, uh, but a few choices uh, for any given pitch class, he was able to say, OK, I need you to use this one so that it can be the uh, mirror reflection of the other pitch in the other row form. OK, but then how, what's the other part of this equation? Um, OK, does this make sense? So you can ask me. You can email me. It doesn't make sense. The other part of this is dyadic invariance. And we talked about invariance a little bit. Um, it's a subject that theorists who specialize in 12-tone music like to talk about. There are different kinds of invariances. We maybe talked about trichordal invariance in the concerto of Webern, Opus 24. In this and other pieces, we find dyadic invariance. A dyad is a two-note pitch class set. And um, how does dyadic invariance work? Well, obviously, one thing we notice, let's go back to our score, is that anytime we have a B flat um, in one hand, we have a G sharp in the other hand. That happens every single time. And it doesn't matter what the row forms are. Okay, and every time we have an A, we have another A. Anytime we have a C sharp, we always have an F. Let's, let's prove this. Uh, let's look for another C sharp and see if there's an F. C sharp, F. Okay, let's look for a B flat and see if there's a G sharp. Um, uh, where where are we? Well, there's a B flat there, and there's an A flat there. Um, there's a D flat, in other words, C sharp and an F. Um, okay, so th we're always there's another B flat and a G sharp right at the end there. So every there are only a limited number of dyads. In other words, every pitch that appears in one hand, not only is the pitch of the other hand going to be equi equidistant on the other side of that A, it's also going to just be simply be the same pitch, which actually makes sense. There's no other way it could be. But in addition to that uh, gamut, Webern also uses this dyadic invariance. How does this work? Well, let's start with this idea. It works if you pair inversionally related form, row forms. What are inversionally related row forms? Well, a P and an I are inversionally related row forms. Or an R and an RI are also inversionally related row forms. So what Webern does, and again, he does this in multiple pieces, he takes two row forms that are inversionally related and um, and then he takes another pair. And what he found was that if the sum of their transposition number is the same, the sum of two different pairs of row forms, inversely related row forms, if the sum of their transposition number is the same, then the dyads created by the order numbers is going to be the same. OK, that's a little bit confusing. But let's illustrate this. And I asked you to do this. I gave you the row. We're going to try this out. OK, I hope this is going to be fun. We'll see what happens. OK, let's choose at random. Um, I'm going to choose, uh, let's say, a, a row form that adds up to 2. OK, so let's take a P0 and an I2. OK, P0, that's going to be P0, I2, B flat. A, D flat, B, 
it's kind of tedious d c g flat f e a flat g e flat okay now let's take i2 c d flat a b a flat b flat e f g flat d e flat i hope this works g okay so one thing you'll notice is we've got a c and an e flat here now when we get the c here i'm c and b flat when we get the c we got a B flat there. So that's one thing we're going to ha have whenever we pair any two inversely related rows, A and D flat, D flat and A, B and B, obviously D and A flat again, C and B. We already looked at that. G flat and E. Let's find our E here, E and G flat, etc. You see how that works. It's kind of interesting. Now, and then you'll notice that the pitches that are shared are always at a, a tritone relationship. Let's choose two other ones that are sum to two. Zero plus two is two. Okay, how about um, P1 and I1? That adds up to two, right? Okay, P1 is going to be B, B flat, D, C, E flat, D flat, G, G flat, F, A, A flat, E. Okay, now let's do I1. That's going to be this. B, C, I think this is going to delight you. A flat, I hope it does. B flat, G, um, A, E flat, E F, D flat, D, G flat. Okay, so we should expect the same pairs, the same dyadic pairs. Okay, here we have a B, B paired with a B, yes. You can see that, B flat and C, yes. Uh, a and D flat, yes. Um, C and B flat, we already saw that, right? G flat and E. G flat and E, there we go, et cetera, F and F, right? Okay, so that number, the sum of the two transposition numbers, which is two in this case, both of these cases, is called the index. Okay, so these, what is it, six dyads, or is it five? I can't remember. Those are invariant when we pair two inversionally related row forms that have the in, the same index number. That's the rule here. And so by using this method, um, Webern ensures let's do this one, that he always, no matter where these occur in the row, because they'll occur in different places depending on which pair of row forms are used, but whenever one pitch come pitch class comes up, you're always going to get the same other pitch class. So it's always the same dyads. And this, of course, facilitates um, that this, um, along with the gamut, it facilitates this inversion canon. It, canon. it makes sure that that happens. OK, let me see if there's anything else. And we're going to, this is the, the next lecture is going to be about Weber and Symphony, Opus 21, exact same things are happening. Let's see if there's anything else we need to talk about. Oh, well, okay, so how does that work in this particular piece? Um, well, the uh, index number for this piece, second movement of Weber's Opus 27, is 10. And so we can kind of see here that Here's, uh, uh, well, I10 and P0. So it adds up to 10. Our index number is 10. Let's take this one again. Zoom out a little bit if I can get my phone to do that. Okay. Okay. 
I10 and P I10 and P0. Okay, they're inversely related. The the index number is 10. I5 and P5, index number of 10, 5 plus 5 is 10. Um, P10 and I0, um, that, of course, inversely related, they add up to 10. And, of course, P7 and I3, 7 plus 3 is 10. Uh, now, of course, we could have, uh, you remember how to add under um, modular arithmetic, if we get a number 12, 12 equals 0, 13 equals 1, 14 equals 2, etc. So we may get an index number. For instance, when I had 2 as our index number, well, we could add a, you know, P11 with a, an I2, or I3, sorry, P11 and I3. I3. 11 plus 3 under modular arithmetic equals 2. Okay, so it could be, you know, we could arrive at that index number in multiple ways. Okay, well, that's that's all we want to say about, you know, oh, yeah, here's the, uh, here are the, here's a listing of all the row form pairs from the second movement. P0, I10, P5, I5. I0, P10, I3, P7. They all add up to 10, and they're inversely related. Therefore, we're going to end up with these dyadic pairs. Okay, we will talk to you soon about Weber and Symphony. Bye.